uh, for these few short moments. I greet you in peace. I salam alaikum. I'm going to bring back up our dear brother, Brother Lawrence Muhammad. Let's give our sister a round of applause, Sister Michonne and Sister Tia. Sister Michonne kind of tall, man. Let's bring the mics down. <laughs> so we thank them. That was valuable information. Did you all get something from that? Yes, sir. Did we talk, get anything about changing our mindset from a poor mindset to a wealthy mindset? Yes, sir. So, okay, so we got something, right? So, so far we haven't wasted your time. Did we get a little something on the health tip? All right, so so far we haven't wasted your time. So at this, praise be to Allah. Yeah, see this is a class. This is an actual class. So this like, this is university. That's right, the University of Islam. So at this time, family, we want to continue with our program. And we want to bring up the local representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan here in the city of New Orleans. And he's going to touch on a subject that's going to just further increase our education for the day. And he's dealing with a key to overcoming life's difficulties, seeing things properly. So I know that's something that I want to hear. Yes, and so are you ready to put on your thinking caps? Yes, sir. Tune your ears in. Help me to bring to the rostrum Student Minister Willie Muhammad. In the most holy name of Allah who appeared to us in the person of Master Farah Muhammad, we thank Almighty God Allah for his coming and we thank Almighty God Allah for his raising up the most humble and honorable Elijah Muhammad. We also thank Almighty God Allah for he and the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad leaving in our midst one for us to gain that will help us gain a better understanding of ourselves and even of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the Honorable and Master Farad Muhammad, and that one is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'd like to greet you all to greet in words of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum. So we thank you all, brothers and sisters, for, uh, for being here. We thank you all for deciding to bless us with your presence. And we thank all of those who took time out to prepare and share some words that were shared prior to me coming up. Thank you, sisters, for the beautiful words that you all have shared and the very informative words that you all have shared. And we're going to get right down to what we're here to talk about today. Prior to us getting to it, I want you all to make sure before you leave, to pick up in a copy of the Final Call newspaper. Make sure you get this paper. We'll have some on the table outside when you get ready to leave, and there'll also be some downstairs in the bookstore. Make sure you stop in our bookstore as well to get copies of DVDs of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, books written by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, one in particular, The Message to the Black Man. So knowledge is power. And there's a saying that says, when you know better, you do better. So when you see our people not doing better, it's because we don't know better. And we're not going to know better just by something falling out of the sky hitting us in our head. We have to pick up a book and read, right? We have to begin to read. And the more we begin to read, the more knowledge we begin to gain, the greater information that we receive, the greater power you and I will have in our ability to understand the world in which we're living in, right? So in this world, it says, they say ignorance is bliss, right? And I think that word means happy, joyous, right? But now here they're saying that you get a joy out of being ignorant. But a lot in the Bible, a, a God in the Bible says the following, he says that, my people die from a lack of knowledge. So look at how this world is in opposition to what God says. In so many words, they're encouraging people to be ignorant, right? If ignorant is bliss, and bliss means happy. But God is saying that the more ignorant you are, the more debt you and I have. 
So today, as Brother Lawrence talked about, this is a place where you are to come and get um, your consciousness elevated. This is a place where you can come and receive word that you can be able to apply in your life. Because if you cannot apply anything that you've heard in a classroom, in a church, to better your life, then it was all vain. It's almost like eating fast food. There was no benefit. And so I want to lay the base of today's talk by sharing with you all some guidance, and even those who are watching via the Internet, sharing with you all some guidance that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan shared with one of our brothers in the Nation of Islam. Our brother, Brother Demetri Muhammad, who's a part of the research team, he told the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan how he has a desire to want, he wanted to travel around the nation and teach other student ministers uh, pastoral skills. And when he say pastoral skills, meaning help them to be able to provide guidance and support and help for people beyond just speaking from the rostrum. And he said he wanted to help us get that. And as he shared that with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the minister told him how when he was a minister in New York, he wanted to do the same thing. So he opened the mosque up on Wednesday for all of the believers who had any problems where they can come and sit with the minister and the minister will hear all of their problems. And the minister said that he did that, but he noticed after sitting here and problem after problem after problem, he will be emotionally drained. And when the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan shared with the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad what he was doing, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, Brother, I did not send you to New York to do that. He said, I did not send you there to hear their problems. He said, I sent you there to teach them Islam. Now, this is the key part. And he said, but if he said, if you teach them Islam properly, they will be able to solve their own problems. So it was not that he would, didn't want the minister to hear their problems, but what he was really telling the minister is that I'm not, I don't want you to enable them. Because sometimes we can give ear to people's problems so much where they now become comfortable in just talking about their problems and don't have any real idea or intention to say, let me do something to solve my problems. Where we get comfortable in just complaining, right? And I was in the experience yesterday, I was watching someone who was talking about a problem that they were experiencing, and when this person will give them different ideas or different suggestions, Every idea or suggestion that was given to them, they came up with a reason of why it couldn't take place. And I'm like, wow. I mean, every one. They came up with a reason. Didn't know that can't happen. And sometimes if you and I are not careful, we can do the same thing, right? So I pray that God blesses me to do just what the most Amir Elijah Muhammad told the minister to teach you to teach myself Islam properly. Now, if you're here for your first time, you hear the word Islam and you're like, I don't want him to teach me Islam. I'm a Christian. I'm a Rastafarian. Whatever we may use to describe ourselves, don't get caught up on a word. Because all Islam means is submission to God's will. And all we are talking about is what Jesus talked about in this book. And here's an example. Go home and read John chapter 6, verse 38. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 38. If we was in the church, I could say, take out your Bibles. We need to start bringing our Bibles and our Korans, right? You should do that. So you can read it here so you don't forget it when you leave. But it says this, Jesus speaking, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will. Jesus said, I came down but to do the will of him that sent me. I just told you that Islam means, Islam means a submission to do God's will. 
in this one verse, Jesus is saying that he was not, he did not come on his own, but someone what? Sent him. Then he said, I have not come to do my own will, but I come to do the will of he who sent me. In Arabic, you call that Islam. See, the enemy has tricked us so much that we are already fighting against our original way of life. We hear Islam and we put up our gods. We hear Muslim and say, that's not me, when really that is the nature of every man and woman. Muslim means one who submits his or her will to do God's will. Simply put, a Muslim is one who obeys God. And look at how we say when you meet a Muslim, you say, I'm not a Muslim. And if we look at the actions of our people, we can tell you definitely not. Because we're not obeying God. Is that right? So I want to attempt, with the help of Allah, to help you and I to be able to solve our problems by teaching on the subject title, A Key to Overcoming Life's Difficulties. A key, one key. There are some others. And that key is seeing things properly. I don't care the oldest person in this room to the youngest person in this room. We all face difficulty. And we're going to face difficulty after difficulty until we're placed back in the earth. So if that is the case, then you and I need to understand how to overcome it. Not to how to succumb to it, but how to defeat difficulty. Because if you and I learn how to defeat difficulty, we increase the, the quality of our lives. But if you and I run from difficulty, guess what? We decrease the quality of our lives. And so the faster you and I understand the purpose of difficulty, the faster we will abandon the expectation that the, we should not experience any difficulty in our lives. Some people today are less religious or don't believe in God because they don't believe that they should believe in God and experience difficulty in their lives. Some people say, how can God be good and I go to church every Sunday? I go to Bible school. I give in tithing. I support the pastor. How can God be good? I go to the mosque meeting all the time. I give in charity. I go after our people. I fast. I pray. But I still have difficulty in my life. In my life. And they begin to say, God can't be God because if he was, he wouldn't allow me to experience difficulty. That's a very immature way of understanding life and viewing God. Y'all are right. Yes, sir. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan points to a simple example. He says to go and study how we came into existence. He said if you study how we came into existence, you will be able to understand how difficulty is a natural part of life. In fact, he said that it is ordained that God established it. He talks about how the minister says this. In the Holy Quran, the book of scripture of the Muslims, we are taught by Allah that he created the human being to face difficulties, not to run away from difficulties. He created the human being to struggle. He goes further. For it is only in struggle that we manifest what God has put within. Before you came to birth from the womb of your mother, you struggled. The very life germ that was the source of your life had the struggle and competition with a hundred million to seven billion sperm to reach an egg. He said it had to swim against gravity upstream in a hostile environment and the one that won that struggle in that competitive journey in hostile environment was you and I. So you were born and prepared for life and for the struggle that accompanies life. That's one against seven billion. 
Do you know you have a greater chance of winning the lottery in Louisiana when you face those terms? One in seven billion? It's not even a one in seven billion uh, chances to win the Powerball. But one in seven billion emitted into a womb where it was hostile. Yes, sir. Where the womb itself was trying to get rid of some of the sperm. Right. Then we had to make a split decision to go to the right or go to the left to find the ovary that housed the egg. Now that was difficulty that you and I had to overcome before we had a head, before we had hands, before we had legs, before we had a degree. Before we had eyes and ears. So if we experienced difficulty when we were just, as Allah says, worthless water, then how can you and I think we're not going to experience difficulty when we begin to start growing into full human beings? Everybody all right? Yes, sir. See, it is important to understand, brothers and sisters, that difficulty is not a bad thing. Difficulty does not mean that God is punishing you. That God is somewhere just saying, ooh, I'm so mad at her right now. Give her some difficulty. Ooh, I'm so mad at him right now. Send this woman into his life and give him this difficulty. And we just walk around saying, man, why God putting this in my life? See, we view difficulty that way is because the enemy has separated us from a real and true and correct understanding of God. So we've been separated from understanding cause and effect and how God works, right? But remember, the minister says that difficulty is set up by God to help us to access God within ourselves. And he says that it is a force that is meant to help us contact, access, and manifest God within. But look at also what the minister says. He says, when you have ease and no difficulty, you will never fully develop what God has put within you. Think about that. Saying we will never, if all we was given is ease. And we say this all the time. What do we say about children who are raised by their parents and they don't have to want for anything? Most of the time they grow up and they're spoiled. Is that right? Daughters, mothers raising sons, and they, their love for their son is so great that they begin to bury the masculine tendencies in him. Yeah. Where they begin to keep him away from the environments that will help him develop the masculine side. Right. So he ends up becoming the very same type of man that they complain about. Because out of their love, they fear that the circumstances may be greater than him. So they keep him away from that difficulty, and guess what? He never develops. And it's the same with daughters, right? The minister goes further. So Allah has ordained struggle. This is the pattern of God when he wants to use a people for his glory. Our sisters learn how to sew. They get the pattern. They lay the pattern on fabric, and then they follow the pattern. And if they follow the pattern, that means that they will produce the garment. Where if God wants to make you and I like him, he knows by what pattern he had to follow to become who he is. So he, needs a, he also knows what you and I must follow in order to become like him. And it's not a pattern that's void of difficulty. I want to keep stressing that point because at the end of this meeting, I want us to leave out here with a better understanding of the purpose of difficulty and how we should respond. All praise is due to Allah. The minister goes further. He says, he, God, doesn't make it easy for you. He makes it hard for you so that the more you struggle, the greater he can bring from you what he has deposited in you. God makes it difficulty, difficult. And that means God may use the lack of growth of a loved one or a friend or a neighbor or somebody you know to bring into your life to put us in that process of difficulty so we can find him inside of us. That's right. Teach. 
the minister says further, or we'll say this. You and I, however, brothers and sisters, we will never contact or access or manifest God in ourselves if you and I possess an incorrect view of the difficulty we experience. We will never find our true self if all we do is curse the difficulty. And we don't see what the difficulty is meant to bring out of us. Most of us don't have what God wants us to have today because we have ran from difficulty. That we have cursed the process that God brought in our life to help us get what we said we want. So the key in overcoming life difficulty is seeing difficulty properly. Say that again. The key to overcoming the hard times or the challenging times in our life is seeing them properly. Right. So the Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan in the lecture, Self-Improving the Basis of Community Development, the minister used an example of a blacksmith. And a blacksmith is a person, like you see the old Western movies, they have the horseshoe, and they got the horse, and they, they, they're taking the horseshoe, and they, they're, they're pounding it into the, the metal, the, what is it called? The, the anvil, but what's the little thing? It's a horseshoe, right? They're putting it on the huff, right? But they also make swords. They also make all other type of metal. The minister talked about this analogy of a blacksmith taking a piece of metal. And in his mind, he has an idea of making this metal into a very precious and expensive sword. But the metal does not know what's on the mind of the blacksmith. The metal is taken out and immediately taken from a place of comfort and is placed in uh, hot coal. Burning where it goes is so, where it's so hot that when he takes the metal out, it looks like lava. Then when he takes it out, you're like, ooh, it's, it's still hot, but it's a little less hot. He puts it on the anvil and starts beating it. Bang, bang, bang. Then he puts it in water. Oh, it's cool. But then it's back into the coal, back into the anvil, beating and beating that process over and over and over again. But imagine if you and I were that piece of steel and we didn't know why that blacksmith picked us up and threw us into the fire. We would be angry at the blacksmith. Man, why did he put us in? Why does he put me in this hot place? And if he loved me, why is he beat me? Right. And if he loves me, why does he give me a little temporary relief? And if he really loves me, why did he put me back in an environment that he heard me say gave me pain? But if before the blacksmith started the process, if he talked to the steel, which was us, and he showed us a picture that said, this is going to be you. And they're going to have people who are going to pay millions of dollars just to possess you. And you will be so expensive and so valuable in their mind that they will take you and won't even use you, but they will put you in a very high, dignified place in their home, and they will brag about you to everybody that comes. And people will write articles and talk about how all of the swords on the earth, you are the most expensive. We will be like, that's what's going to happen to me? Come on. Sign me up. But then he said, listen, but I got to put you in this hot place. I got to hit on, I got to put, I got to, I got to beat on you a little bit to get you in shape. Then I got to give you a little relief. Then I got to do that process again and again and again until I transform you just to this raw piece of steel to where you look pretty like that. You might be like, God, it's going to be painful. But I'm going to look like that. Let me strap up my tennis shoes. I'm ready. Right? All praise is due to a lot. But what was the factor that determined that we'll be willing to be in the process? Is that now we properly, we had a proper understanding of the difficulty we were going to experience. 
And not only did we know what we were going to experience, we also knew something else that's important. We knew the why. And we knew that this difficulty that we were going to experience, guess what? No matter how painful it is, I know that it's not going to kill me. So we will be more willing to go through the process because we have proper sight. But if we don't know that, then we curse God. We curse the blacksmith. We question the blacksmith's motives. We assign reason to why he's doing what he's doing. He's putting me in this situation because he dislikes me. Or we go even further and say, I'm in this situation because I'm low down and no good. I'm cursed by God. I'm forsaken by God. Maybe I'm in this situation because my skin is darkened. Or my hair is a certain way. Maybe I'm in this situation because of the parents that I came from. So we begin to start assigning all of these negative reasons to a process of that's meant to make us like the, the creator. Y'all are right. Yes, sir. So as we gather here today, brothers and sisters, reflect on the, your own circumstances in your lives right now. What are you going through? That this difficulty may have us feeling like we're ready to throw in the towel. Or we're ready just to lay down and we're hearing that count like in boxing. One, two, three. We can get up at three, but man, that difficulty is so hard, I'm about to lay down. Get this over with. Or we may be in the corner where it's like, come on, you have one, five seconds of bell about to ring. You got to get back into the fight. No, I'm not going back out there. Or we may be in an even greater part where we now may begin to start questioning God, questioning our faith. Man, no matter how much I've been coming to this place for years after years, my life don't seem like it's getting better. I'm trying to be faithful. In fact, I am faithful. But why is it that I keep having all of these hard times in my life? And if we're not careful with that, we begin to start cursing the very creator that heard our prayers and said, let me put them in an in a, in a environment that will make them out of what they say they want. See, when the enemy disrupted our understanding of God, it gave us a mystery God. He gave us a mystery God understanding where we want the crown, but we don't want to go to the cross. I want the benefit, but I don't want to have to do anything. I want the best of what God has to offer, but I don't want to have to give him anything. Nor do I don't want to have to give him anything. I don't want to experience not one moment of uncomfortability. I don't want to have any difficulty. I want it where I just got it. And if somebody asks me, what did you do to get it? They will say, I didn't experience no pain. When you and I, the fact that we came here, our mothers had to go through pain to give birth to us. But after she saw the child, whatever pain she experienced went away because the child was more valuable than whatever little temporary pain she experienced. Y'all are right. Yes, sir. So what difficulty is going on in my life? What difficulty is going on in your life? What difficulty are you experiencing at home, in your relationships or lack of relationships with your children, in your marriage or on your job? And the other question we have to ask is, how are we viewing that difficulty, right? See, this is the key part. If we see the difficulty as something that we cannot be, that's something that we cannot overcome, we will find that that view of that difficulty, this is very important, will kill one of the most important qualities that you and I need. Not an option. It will kill one of the most important qualities that you and I need to overcome difficulty. And guess what that is? Our desire. 
The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan says this. We were talking about it on Friday. He said, desire is the food that builds the will. That if the will doesn't have any desire, that means it starves to death. He said, desire causes us to strive to achieve whatever the object of our desire is. So if we have not obtained what we want, maybe it's because our desire is not as great as it needs to be in order to get it. He said the desire to attain a goal brings us face to face with difficulty. We're complaining about difficulty? Well, it's the desire that you and I had that's bringing us face to face. Because the desire knows that in order for me to get what I want, I have to go through the door of difficulty. He says, when we undergo the trial of difficulty, the trial may be so intense that it extinguishes the light of the desire to attain the goal. That means the trial, the difficulty can be so great that it puts out the fire. You know what a fire extinguisher is? It sprays, the, the, the trial is spraying like a fire extinguisher on our desire and it puts it out. And guess what happens when we no longer have that desire? We're not going to have the will, right? Isn't it interesting? We've heard the statement they say, where there is a will, there is a way. Yes, sir. But if there is no desire, there is no will, and we will never see the way. So it starts with the desire. Whatever it is that we want, we must make sure that we fuel the desire and feed the desire which feeds the will, and we're going to get it. The things that you and I have right now, we have them because we have the desire. Oh, I just got to be with her. And wait, wait, man, she got a boyfriend. I don't care. He can't do it like I'm going to. He can't treat it like I treat her. No matter what people say, man, she live way in a different state. I don't care. I'm going to be with her. When that desire is so great, we don't see the obstacles. And when we see that, when the obstacles are brought to us, we think all we're thinking about is how I'm going to already overcome them. Oh, girl, I saw this purse. Oh, I want it. But I thought you just said you, you, the finance is kind of tight. Yeah, I hear that, but I'm going to get that purse. Be selling now, ladies, cookies, everything. So if you and I look at the things that we have, it can be clothing, it can be money, it can be jobs, it can be material items. We got it because our desire was greater than the difficulty. And if you and I look at the things that we don't have, we don't have them because our desire was punked by the difficulty. So I want to point to a scripture for us to go and study. 1 Samuel chapter 17 it comes from the message translation I'm going to read from. And I know, look, with this Bible when I was coming up, I did not understand it. Thou shalt. I'm like, man, I don't know what these people are talking about. But it was the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that helped me to understand this scripture. Where now I can look into this scripture using the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and of the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, which you and I can access now just with a push of a button on YouTube. Where you can read in this message final call newspaper and you hear the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan explain scripture and explains our purpose. And then you open up this book and you have a better understanding of it. So in 1 Samuel... Chapter 17 is about the story of David. So the book starts off where David, where the children of Israel, the army of Israel, were getting ready to fight the Philistines who were the enemy of them. So all of the armies came up. The children of Israel were on one mountain. The Philistines were on another mountain. And they were looking at each other like, yo, we about to do battle. But then look at what verses 4 through 7 said. A giant, nearly 10 feet tall, stepped out from the Philistine line into the open. Goliath from Gath. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor. 
It said he had his armor weighed 126 pounds. He wore bronze shin guards and carried a bronze sword. His spear were like his spear was like a fence rail. The spear tip alone weighed over 1,500 pounds. His shield barrier walked ahead of him. He had a shield where they had people had to carry it. Now, we're not getting into all this, somebody being 10 feet tall. I think what that scripture is showing is showing that how they viewed this man. Right? So they're getting ready to fight. He steps out and look at what he steps out and said. Goliath stood out and called out to the Israelite troops. Why bother using your whole army? Am I not a Philistine enough for you? And you are committed to Saul, aren't you? Saul was the king. He said, so pick your best fighter and pit him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you will become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day. Give me a man. Let us fight it out together. Now, let's say he was 10 feet tall. Would that mean he didn't bleed? That didn't mean that he can't die? It never said that he was invincible. It never said that he couldn't die. All it said that he was tall and he had a lot of armor. But you got armor as well. But they got caught up because they incorrectly perceived this difficulty. And look at what they said. The very next verse. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistine challenge, they were terrified and lost all hope. Now they hadn't even seen him fight. You done met some people, they be real big. You're like, man, look at dude. And when it get down to it, he be the first to run. So you should know, don't just go by off of appearances. Is that right? They just were going off just because how he looked. They were terrified. And they didn't lose some hope. They lost all hope. Nobody asked Goliath. What's your record in these streets? <laughs> they just were gone, right? Many of us can relate because a difficulty arises in our life and we are challenged and it terrifies us. And we lose hope. And you know what hope is defined as? Despair, which is a complete loss or absence of hope. Right? Just lose, just give up. Then the word hope is defined as a feeling of expectation. But going back to that powerful word, hope is a desire for a certain thing to happen. So when they lost hope, they lost their desire. And we've already been told by the minister, when you lose the desire, you lose the will. So when they had not even swung a blow, they had already lost the desire. They lost the will. So we knew they weren't going to be ready to fight them. They had already been pumped. Right? See, believing and belonging to God is the first step. They were the army of God and they were the people of God. But that's just not enough for us to go in and get the victory. We have to show God that we believe that we are his people and he backs us. We have to show God that we say, oh, I'm a child of God and I'm highly favored and blessed. Well, show me in your actions you believe you are a child of God. Because what father will see their child face with something and not give them what they need to overcome it? Is that right? So Goliath challenged Israel, the Israelite army for 40 days. Every day he went out and told them the same thing. Bring somebody out here so we can get into it. Every day. And every day they grew in their fear, in their hope. Now when they already said they lost all hope on the first day. Then they went even further. They were way up. They were way in the red. 
And the lesson that that shows you and I is that every time we don't confront difficulty, it grows stronger in our lives. All praise is due to Allah. And guess what? Every time we don't confront it, it begins to appear to be even more insurmountable. That we don't think we can overcome it. Right? So now David comes along. So that's how the king in the army saw it. Now David comes along. He came to the battle site to bring food to his brothers when the armies had gathered, right? So when he was bringing food to his brothers, the armies gathered, and David happened to be there on one of the days, I guess it was the 40, the 40th day, when Goliath was pulling their corn. That's uptown, pulling their corn, like punking them, terrifying them. I apologize for that slang. <laughs> You know, selling. Why he's selling wolf tickets, right? <laughs> David, David came and he heard the dude talking, and so listen to what David said while they were talking together, talking about the army. The Philistine champion Goliath of Gath stepped out from the front of the lines of the Philistines, and he gave his usual challenge. David heard him. The Israelites to a man the Israelites frightened. The talk among the troops was this. Have you ever seen anything like this? This man openly and defiantly challenges Israel. The man who kills the giant will have, will have it made. The king will give him a huge reward and offer his daughter as a bride and give his entire family a ride. Basically, he's saying they're going to be rich if they, handle, if they fight this man, right? David, who was talking to the men standing around him, he asked, what's in it for the man who kills this Philistine and gets rid of this ugly blot on Israel's honor? That's what David said about Goliath. He said he's an ugly, he's a stain. And you know with a stain, you can get rid of it. He said he's an ugly stain on the honor of Israel. And then David said, who does he think he is? Anyway, this uncircumcised Philistine taunting the armies of the living God. David was not impressed. David didn't mention how tall he was. David didn't talk about how he had armor that weighed 126 pounds and a spear tip that was 15, over 15 pounds. David saw him as an ugly stain. David saw him as an uncircumcised Philistine, taunting the armies of the living God. When he said uncircumcised, the children of God were supposed to, the people who were quote unquote Jews, they get circumcised which is supposed to be a sign of them being the people of God. So David saw him and was like, who is this dude who is a disbeliever in God? Who, who backs us? So they told David, everyone told David what the king had offered, right? So if we look at the response of the king and the army compared to the response of David, what was the difference? David, it was how they viewed the difficulty. David was not impressed by how he looked, right? And maybe David understood that because in his early days, somebody misjudged him. His own father misjudged him because how he looked. That when the servant of God, the prophet of God was sent by God to find the next one who was going to be anointed, when David's daddy got all of his brothers... And he looked at him and said, oh, he's handsome. This has to be him. And God said, no, that's not him. Then another one said, well, maybe it's him. And God said, no, that's not him. And they went through all of the sons. And the man asked, he asked David's father, Jesse, he said, don't you have another son? And David's daddy said, in so many words, I think he called him a runt. He said, I have another son, but he's like a little runt. His own daddy looked down on him. His own daddy didn't think about even including him in the selection process because his own father judged him by how he looked. 
But God said, I don't judge by the appearance, I judge by the heart. Right on, praise is due to a lot. So maybe David knew, don't get caught up in appearances. Because it's not an appearance that makes somebody, it's what's inside of them who the real person is. So David, the word Philistine means a materialistic person who has a disdain for culture and intelligence. That's what the Philistines mean. What the Mosaic Elijah Muhammad describes is, that is, a savage. David saw this Goliath as, look at this person who doesn't even know the knowledge of himself and is living a beast life, right? So the army and Saul, they had an attitude of defeat, which colored their perception and their mood. And on Friday, we were talking about it, how we have to be careful about the attitude we have when we face a difficulty. Because our attitude would affect how we see the difficulty. Listen to what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said. He said, in fact, attitude can give you or damage your ability to re perceive reality. He said, mood can color your perception. That our attitude can cause us to see something other than what it really is. He goes further, the minister says, we cannot have a powerful will with a weak attitude. Think about that. We cannot have a powerful will with a weak attitude. So the question we want to ask ourselves is, how is our attitude toward the difficulty that we are facing right now? Is it weak or is it strong? Is it somewhat strong but more weak? And if we have a can-do attitude toward the difficulty we are facing, more than likely, we are already overcoming that difficulty. But if our attitude is a weak one, we're like, Lord, what am I going to do after I lead this monster? I got to still go deal with this issue. We're already defeated. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. We've already been punked. We're already thrown in the white towel. We're all ready to lay down and give us the 10 count. One, two, three. Matter of fact, we count. Just skip five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? Look at the word attitude is defined as a, the manner, the disposition, the feeling, and the position. In the word disposition, you have the word position. Isn't it interesting that they say our attitude determines our altitude? Altitude is how high we go. Don't you know that when you get on an airplane, I don't care how large the Superdome is, the higher we get up, the Superdome begins to get smaller in size. Because the higher we get up, we really begin to start seeing how small things are relative. But as long as we're on that level, it looks larger than us. So this is why the Jesus comes to give us wings, as it says in the Quran. To elevate our consciousness. And isn't it interesting when you look in the word giant, when you drop the G and the I in the word giant is ant? One of the smallest insects that live on the planet Earth? Well, maybe God is trying to tell us that this giant that you think is really an ant. And all you and I need to do is get the proper perception, the proper view. And we will see it as an ant. So I often tell this story about the tiger guru. Where this man was knocking out wild tigers with his bare hands in India. And these young boys came up to his door and they were like, yo, man, you knock out tigers with your bare hands? They was like, man, how you do that? And he said, the only difference between you and I when it comes to knocking out tigers, he said, you see it as a tiger, but I see it as a kitten. His view. Go and look at those boxers. When Mike Tyson lost his first boxing match, his first two, what was the difference between Buster Douglas and Evander Holyfield compared to all of the others? When they were interviewed the other boxers, they'll be in there punching a the punching bag all sweaty, and they put that microphone in their face. So what you think you're going to do against the champ tonight? Well, I'm just going to come out and try my best. 
Like they was talking all that during the warm-ups, during the promotion, but when it, when it was that night, I'm just gonna try to do my best. He is the champ. But when they talked to Evander Holyfield, Evander Holyfield came out with a scripture that I think it says like, my faith in God can give me victory over anything. He came out pumped up to gospel music. He did not show the fear that other boxers had when it came about Mike Tyson. Same thing with Buster Douglas. Buster Douglas had already lost a relative, so he felt like, what else do I have to lose? I'm going to give him my all. He had already felt that I have already survived something greater than this man I'm about to fight with gloves on. And as a result of that, he got the record. He goes down in history as the first person that knocked out Mike Tyson. Right? Attitude. So, brothers and sisters, it is also important for us to know that when we, infect, when we encounter difficulties, guess what we're also going to face? Doubters. We're going to face doubt externally and internally. When David came, guess where the doubt came from first? His own brother. Then, after that, it came from the very king who he admired. So listen to what happened. Elab. His older brother heard David fraternizing with the men and lost his temper. He got mad at David for asking a question about something he was afraid to do. He said, what are you doing here? Why aren't you minding your own business, tending to the scrawny flock of sheep? See how they downplayed what David did? Right. I know you were up here. I know, what, I know what you're up here to do. You've come up here to see the sights, hoping for a ringside seat in a bloody battle. How is it going to be a bloody battle? Y'all already punked out. And you mad about him asking about what's going on. Projecting your fear and your cowardice on somebody else. So he told, David told him, what is with you? David replied, all I did was ask a question. Then it says, ignoring his brother. He turned to someone else and asked the same question and got the same answer before. The things David was saying were picked up and reported to Saul who sent for him. Now the king heard about him. So the king told David. David went up to the king. He said, master, said David, don't give up hope. One of the most difficult things to do is to help somebody who's already afraid. One of the most difficult things to do is to try to get someone to believe in themselves who don't believe in themselves. You can tell them they're beautiful. You can tell them they're intelligent. You can tell them they're great, but in their mind they're feeling like he's a, he or she is just lying to me. So you wear yourself out trying to help them. So David went to his, he said, Master, don't give up hope. Saul answered, David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You know, there's this saying that says, the people, it says, like, what, the people who, if you, if you can't do, don't, if you, if you feel you can't do something, then you should be quiet and don't tell the people who feel like they can do it to not try. I'm right. not doing it right. right. But it's basically saying, man, keep your mouth quiet. Right. That's the least you can do. Right. So... He told him, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced. And he's been at this fighting business since before you were born. But the key part is what the scripture says, David ignored the doubters. Right? He did not allow their doubt to disrupt his attitude. And thus the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that when you protect your desire, you protect your will. How are we facing up about, how, what's our record toward our own internal doubts? And those external doubts, right? When we face difficulty, what's our record? That doubt come in, yeah, they are right, I can't do it. Do you know, I think in the 40, 40, the 40 mile dash, I don't know the race, and now the 40, the 40 yard dash or something, in the early 1900s, they were saying that nobody could run that dash 
what's the what's the rate that they say whatever this race was they were saying that nobody could run it at a certain time and so everybody was saying well you can't run it under four minutes but this one man said no i can run it and he ignored the doubters and guess what he ran it and did what they said could not be done and guess what do you know that after that one man broke that record, there have been thousands of people who have run faster than that time now? That one man broke the mold. He got outside of the box of people telling him what can't be done. And a lot of times you and I don't try something because somebody is always there to tell us why it can't be done. So we don't even try, right? So what stood between David and his destiny was a giant, was a difficulty. As you and I sit here, brothers and sisters, what stand, what's on the other side of the difficulty that we are facing? If David would have taken the view of the army soldiers or his brother or Saul, guess what? I highly doubt that we would be here talking about David today. Because that was the first great feat that David did. So if David would have listened to them, he would have never slayed the giant. And more than likely, we would probably be talking about Jamal or somebody. <laughs> so what's on the other side of the difficulty that we face? Could the difficulty that we face in our marriage and our relationships, could on the other side of that difficulty be wedding bliss? could be all the joy and the love that we need? Right. What's on the other side of the financial problems that we're facing? Right. What would happen if we really addressed them and focused them? Right. Could it be financial freedom? Right. Right. What's on the other side of those feelings within our mind that tell us that we're not worth anything? Mm. That you're not valuable? What would happen if we came, if we broke through that difficulty? Maybe we will see that we are of immense value yes, but we will never see that if we don't face the difficulty right. almost wrapping it up y'all all right yes, i know y'all ready to go see the saints game yes, i'm joking so listen i'm not lifting up these scriptures so we can say oh look at what david did oh look at what david did david did this david did that David, he was victorious over this. But listen what the album of the Lord's Farrakhan said how we should use the scriptures. He said, there is no point in consistent reference to the prophets and their struggle to overcome difficulties unless these references serve to motivate, inspire us to say, I will do exactly that. I will achieve, achieve my objective." Yes. There's no sense to be telling me about Jesus did this, Jesus did that, and it don't inspire you to do this right. or do that. Right. Don't tell me about what Muhammad did in Arabia if it can't inspire you to do it in your own home. Right. Right. Don't talk about what all these, what Noah did, what Lot did, when it can't even inspire you and I to challenge our own yes. little yes. difficulties. If that's our way of using the scripture, you can throw it in the trash because you ain't going to get anything out of it. And we're like Shaq at the free throw line. We missed the point. Our praise is due to Allah. So in closing, our praise is due to Allah. So dear brothers and sisters, when you and I have problems with our physical sight, where do we go? You go to someone who's skilled with the ability to properly diagnose, diagnose our sight, right? Right, right? Who has the know-how to give us the treatment that we need that can help us to see better, right? right. So basically, we go to an optometrist, right? Optometrist. Eye doctor, and keep it right like that. <laughs> so that's easy for physical sight. But here's a question. Where do we go when we need somebody to help us to fix our sight to see difficulty properly? Can't go to an eye doctor. Can't go to America's Best Eyeglasses. We need somebody with a special skill. 
that if Allah says in the Quran that he created us to face difficulty and that difficulty is not a curse, it's not a punishment, but instead it's a process that Allah has ordained to help us meet him in ourselves. And if we don't see difficulty like that, that means our spiritual sight is off. So we need to go to a spiritual doctor that can help us clean and get to get our eyesight. When you go home, go and read this verse, Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 22 through 26. So here it says, Jesus came to Beth, Beth, what was this? Beth, Bethesda. And they brought him a blind, they brought unto him a blind man. And they besought, some scriptures say that they begged Jesus to touch this blind man. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of town. And when he led him out of town, after he led him out of town, Jesus spit in the man's eyes. And he put his hands on the man, not to rub it off like, oh, I accidentally. He put his hands on the man's eyes and he asked him if he saw all right. And the man said, he looked up and he said, I see men walking as trees. So after Jesus heard it, like you see men walking as trees, Jesus touched his eyes again and he made them look up and the man's eyes were restored. And he said, I see clearly now I see men as they are. And then Jesus sent him away to his home, but Jesus told him to not go back to the town that he came from and not to tell anyone what he did for him. Now let's look at this story. What's the first thing that stands out to you like, man, this is kind of strange? <laughs> spitting in a man's eyes? I know some translations say spittle, but the King James says spit. And I don't care in every society on the planet Earth. Spitting on somebody is considered to be an insult and an invitation to get them dogs put on you. Them dogs mean paws, hands, fists. You get my point, right? But why would God allow this to be written about his servant? Here's a man that some people he healed according to the scriptures that he never saw. Some people he healed, he touched them. Some people he said, based upon your faith, you are healed. Well, damn, man, why I can't get that treatment? Why you got to spit in my eyes? Right? I think that the scientists who wrote this scripture, they wrote that scripture in an effort to let us know that there is a deeper meaning to that. Notice the blind man never complained. Right? So this act of Jesus was only alarming to those who witness it and those who read about it now. The number one person that should have been tripping is the blind man. In none of the scriptures does a blind man make any complaint. There's something into that, right? Yes, sir. And then the scripture says that Jesus led the blind man out of the city. That means that the blind man submitted to Jesus' guidance. Right. He didn't fight when Jesus was trying to pull him. Like, man, let my hand go. Where you bringing me? Right. He didn't even know we never saw Jesus. But he let a stranger take his hand and leave him, lead him from a place that he was familiar with and from friends that he was familiar with. Then the man spit in his face. Y'all all right? After Jesus spit in his face, he's touched him and he said, can you see something? Right. And we know that the man said he see men walking as trees. I believe, brothers and sisters, that the spitting represents a teaching that looks insulting and offensive to those who see it, but not to the man and woman who that teaching is meant to heal. Oh, this Jesus used a method of healing people that was outside of the medical world. Imagine how doctors would look at Jesus talking about, I'm going to spit in his eyes and I'm going to heal him. 
They be like, man, what type of quack you went and got? This dude talking about spitting in your eyes. At least I can go get a laser and deal with your cataracts, and you might be able to see. To me, it symbolizes that this one who will come, that this Jesus will come with a method that the world will see as strange. They will see it as being an insult, but it will be an insult because it will be an insult to the world of Shaitan. It will be an insult to white supremacy. Because when you look at spit, spit comes out of the mouth. So whatever this Jesus uses is going to come out of his mouth. But what will come out of his mouth would help this man properly see. It will look gross. It will look like it's not worth anything. When you see spit, you don't stop and say, let me get an Instagram pic. You frown at it. And like, what nasty person is spit on this ground like that? <laughs> so the most Amir Elijah Muhammad came with a teaching right. saying that the black man and woman, that every time you look at a black man, you're looking at God. Oh, that's, so, man, why is he doing that? That's so insulting. That's, he's, he's spitting in the face of God, right? All praise is due to Allah. Oh, he's, he's spitting in the face of God. That's an insult to say such with all the people on the planet Earth. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that what you have been taught about God is wrong, that God is a man, has always been a man, will always be a man. Oh, that's shirk. He's spitting in the face of all of the years of scholarship. He's making mockery. And what person would allow, imagine how the people saw the blind man. Why would the blind man just sit there and let the man spit in his face? So why would somebody go to the temple and hear this man talk about God being a man? That's an insult. That's, 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 that's child's play. Then he goes even further. The people that everybody has written off and said that they are nobody, he says that they are the people of God. And not only that, that this God came for them. Oh, no, that's an insult. Oh, no. That's, an ins that's disrespectful. Is that right? But don't we say in this book, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that part of his mission was to give, he said part of the condition of the so-called Negro that they were deaf, that they were dumb, and they were blind. So we should be looking for one to come and spit in our face. We should be looking for one to come with something that comes out of his mouth that can help us see properly. Is that right? So this Jesus represents a man who comes to open the ears of the so-called Negro, who comes to give the so-called Negro knowledge so they can no longer be dumb, but he also comes to give them a word that can help them see. So Jesus let the man, he first did him, look what he first had to do. He first had to lead him out of his current environment. He had to separate him. And the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan just talked about separation. Because you and I cannot heal as long as we are in the same environment that caused us to be sick. You can't clean dark color clothing and white color clothing together. Because in your effort to clean white clothing, you damage the color clothing. So in separating them, there's healing for the people of God, and there's also healing for the enemy if they accept it. Right? So when Jesus, he brought them out, the key part, the man submitted. And then when he spit in his face the first time, he had to touch him. He said, how do you see? He said, I see men as trees. His sight wasn't all 2020 at that point. He saw them as trees. A tree could represent an institution. Trees are rooted. There are some of these trees you see on St. Charles. They're older than us. But he said that I see them as trees who are walking. When you look at a tree, he said he saw a tree who was also a man. People seek refuge in trees. 
When the sun gets so hot, people go to the tree for shade. People cut down trees to get stuff to build homes with. Right? To use, they get, they extract from the tree that which can help provide for their needs. That tree and what this man saw is how you and I see white folks society. We see them as a place to seek refuge in when things get hot. We see them as being the source where we can actually get from what, get our needs satisfied. But God had to send a Jesus to us that can spit in our eyes and record, let, let us know that that is not who you seek refuge in. No, I got to get you to see properly. Is that right? Oh, praise is due to Allah. So I've been touched by that Jesus. I've had to spit in my eyes because I didn't always see difficulty as an opportunity to manifest the God in myself. But if it were not for the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in Study God Number 3, Overcoming Difficulty, I would not be able to say that I understand the purpose of difficulty. Right, right, right. That difficulty is my opportunity to get what God has deposited in myself. Right. All praise is due to Allah. But if I run from it, brothers and sisters, I would never be able to access the God in me. And if you run from difficulty, you won't be able to access the God in you. And then Jesus tells the man after he healed him, he said, don't return back to that town. Don't go back to those who doubted because the city where Jesus, where the man came from, was a city, biblical scholars say, that the people who lived in that city, they doubted every miracle Jesus did. So he was letting them know, don't go back to that town. Because there's a great possibility that if you return to that place, you will be blind again. So once you and I are given sight, we can't go back to that that caused us to be blind in the first place. But then after that, brothers and sisters, we can no longer live our life seeing men as trees walking. We have to see them for what they are. But guess what? If he was able to see them properly, then that means now he was able to see himself properly. And if you and I can see ourselves properly being direct descendants of God, we can use our force and we can use our power to change or make a decision to leave the environment that's not beneficial to us. Thank you all. May Allah continue to bless each and every one of you. All praise is due to Allah. So dear brothers and sisters, this is our acceptance portion of our program. What we give you, if you're here for your first time, second time, third time, I have a many amount of times that you've come, you give you the opportunity to accept the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and enter into a process where you grow into your divine, powerful selves, right? So we ask simple questions. One, how many of you believe what you heard today to be good and true First for yourself and second for our people. If so, can you raise your hand? Simple question. Now the other question is for you to decide. After agreeing that what you heard to be today to be good and true for yourself and for our people, how many of you are ready to accept the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and become a member of the Nation of Islam today? Is there anyone that's ready to make that decision? If so, can you raise your hand? Anyone? You're my little man. <laughs> Well, we will say this, brothers and sisters. Even if you're not ready to make that decision today, make Muhammad Mas the place where you go to on a Sunday to begin to be spiritually and mentally elevated. You're looking for a place to go. Why not say, I know I'm going to be here all through the week and I'm going to be wilding out. I know I might be drinking a little something, whatever, but on Sunday I'm going to go to the mosque. Can we at least start there? Can we... And then when starting that, say, and then on top of me coming every Sunday or when the Sundays I can make it, I'm going to bring somebody else. Right. Start there because you are already a part of the nation of Islam. So I'll leave you with the greeting words of peace and paradise. And I bring up our brother, Brother Lawrence Muhammad. 
And prior, we want to do this. Come, come up, brother. We have our brother, brother, brother Antoine celebrated his birthday on yesterday, right? That's so we want to give our brother a round of applause. You got it? And we, as a token of our appreciation for you, brother Antoine, we wanted to give you, you don't have to get up. We want to give you that card from the believers and that lapel pin, all right? So may Allah continue to bless each and every one of you all. Assalamu alaikum. Come on, we can do better than that, right? Let's give him. Man, that was a good message. Praise be to Allah. Man, did we get something out of that? Yes, sir.